Hey, thanks for watching the sermon. Uh, just a brief note at the beginning, the camera didn't catch all of it, but it catches most of it, so continue watching, and I hope it blesses your day. There's a thing on, there's a thing on Facebook the other day that said, uh, if your preacher makes a good point on Super Bowl Sunday, you should sprinkle it with Gatorade. <laughs> we don't do that here. Since we couldn't find enough Gatorade to immerse me, um, we're just going to leave that alone. Wendy brought me this today and claimed she was going to pour it over me, but then she gave it to me, which was a disaster on her part, because now it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, announcement before we begin the sermon, uh, the baby shower for Karen Niece's baby girl is today at 2. Uh, at the home of Nelda and Raymond Wilson on uh, Cypress Street in Nashville. Uh, so I guess once you just get on Cypress Street for balloons, and uh, you will be able to find it. Also, next Sunday, I do want to put in another plug, of just also and also some logistics. Next Sunday will not be Mission Sunday, but it will be Pollock Sunday. Got it? Okay. We are moving Pollock Sunday to Second Sunday, so because the... Um, the Good News Singers will be here. The Good News Singers, I thought, I, I may still do it, but on the bulletin we may put, welcome, uh, welcome Braden Bowman and the Good News Singers, like real tiny. Because <laughs> Braden, Braden sings bass for our that group, and uh, if you have it, like Braden was a pretty good bass when he was here. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 7 being the best, he was like 6. <laughs> and he, he, he was a pretty good faith. He had, I, I was listening to them online, and it is, he's, he's gotten ridiculous. Like it's, I don't know where he found those low notes, but he is hitting them. Uh, and it, it'll, be, it'll be really neat to see him and see the people that he's been working with. Uh, they're going to lead our worship. Uh, we don't let college kids preach here, so I'll preach, and, and then we you know, and then we'll, and then they're gonna uh, uh, perform for us afterwards. Please come be part of that. If you don't typically come to potluck, you think, well, I don't want to. We don't go to potluck, but I want to come here. Then go, go eat real quick at the Sizzler and come back. Um, but we definitely want um, you to come hear that that performance. I think that it'll be real uplifting, and just come to that worship. It'll be really good. Uh, so please come and be part of that. So Jesus gets off of a boat from uh, and after traveling across the lake, and a crowd runs up to him and gathers around him like they did. So Jesus' life, this is what it has turned into. Uh, you, is your, if you're a parent or a new parent, and you're, uh, one of the hardest things about being a new parent is that you've got this child that um, sleeps all the time, Except when you sleep. And then there's always those moments where you think, is this what my life is now? Like, is this what it is? Um, and you think, are we going to do this forever? And it feels like you're going to do it forever. But Jesus' Jesus's life was this now. It was this new uh, thing where he would he'd get away from one group, travel across a lake um, on the boat, and get off the boat, and there was another group around some and sometimes the, there was people who said there goes Jesus and they just ran around the lake to get to him and people were constantly needing Jesus uh, the story we find we're going to be with today is in Mark chapter 5 I should click over Did that change it doesn't change all right good all right Mark chapter 5 when Jesus had crossed again the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, maybe your uh, translation says synagogue rulers, uh, one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, "My little daughter is at the point of death." Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with it. Now, what happens here is, uh, is a man of high standing. If you are a synagogue leader, it means that at this local synagogue, people couldn't make a trip 
to the temple every day, but they also wanted to come and learn. The synagogue is not something we find even talked about in the Old Testament. But in, by the time the New Testament comes around, they've had these little synagogues placed up all over the places. These are these are like a good way to think of them is they were like church buildings the way we understand them today. Um, that's not exactly right, but that's the best thing. That's corollary to that. So uh, this guy was a synagogue leader. So that meant one of two things: he either was the guy in charge of getting um, the daily services together. He was, when you went to the synagogue and experienced something, Jairus had a role in organizing and laying that out. Or, he was such an honorary member of the synagogue, he wasn't an organizer, but he was an honorary member of the synagogue, that, that they just named him that. You could get that name um, honorarily, which I think is a word. And honorarily, is that a right? None of it is to a word, Alyssa. You quit shaking your head at me. We're going to have this out later. Look it up. Now, uh, I get all defensive when a teenager starts shaking their head at me. No, but there is. Uh, so you get this. You get this award. You get this name either because you did something or because you're you're worthy of it. So this guy, no matter what is a respected member of the community. He's a respected member of the, of the group, and they all join, to, like they, they see him come up, and they see him get on his knees and beg. This is a shocking thing, to have a member of, a high class member of society come and get down on Jesus, and he's just, he's at the point of desperation. Jerry. So Jesus goes with him. Now, we tell these stories sometimes, uh, these stories of these miracles, like they're cartoons. Because when we think of them, what we actually think of are the, are the pictures, at least if you grew up in church, you think of the pictures in your picture book. Of white beauty pageant sash Jesus, taller than everyone else. And then Jarius comes up and is on the ground. We see the clip art in our head, but miracles weren't clip art. They, this was an event that happened. It was an event that occurred, and he gets off the boat. People come up. Jarius runs up, comes through the crowd, gets down on his knees, and says, "You've got to come heal my daughter." And Jesus, of course, yes. Come on, let's go. And they go. Now, on their way, something happens, and that something is what I want to talk about this morning. There's a woman who's been bleeding for years. Your, your translation says hemorrhage, I think, to clean up exactly what it was. It's a delicate issue. But this woman had been bleeding for years. So let's look, read it. And a large, crowd, a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. Okay, if you are, let's compare the two people. We've got Jairus, respected member of society, respected leader, and then we've got this woman, not even named. We don't even get a name from her. So Jairus, respected member, woman, who's not... Respected. Jairus is a respected religious leader, which means he handled, all, made sure all of the things in the uh, synagogue were prepped and ready. That means they were clean. He had to wash. He had to, he had to follow the religious law. This woman, by her very nature, by her very disease, was considered by the Jewish community unclean. <coughs> so she was not to be touched, and she was not. To touch. Look what she did. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched him. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, if I just touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed from her disease. And then something really crazy happens. 
Now that was crazy. But something even crazier happens. Jesus, immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Okay, pause the story right there real quick. So Jesus gets out of the boat, the crowd comes up, Jairus comes up, is begging. He says, oh yes, of course, we're going. And they, they, they're walking. They're probably walking at a fairly quick pace. The daughter, as it turns out, is in dire need of help. She is about to die. And he is, Jesus is walking, following Jairus. And Jairus is saying, come on. And they're, they're going to Jairus' house. And this woman is, is crowded in around him. Now, the pictures have always shown her on her hands and knees, like sneaking up. Y'all remember that picture? She's like reaching. But to catch someone crawling who's heading toward a house where a child is dying, to save the child, you're, I mean, you have to be a really fast crawler in my estimation. I'm guessing she's sort of just blending in with the crowd, just fits her way in, and just if I could just graze up against his coat. And she does. Now, all of this quick uh, action where Jesus is, Jesus is walking so quick across the, uh, uh, across the village to this house, and they're on their way, and it's, it's, it's an emergency. Just a flat emergency. Jesus has to heal this woman. But then we go, we go, we get back to this scene where he says, Well, what did you what, who touched you? I think everyone around him thought, What? It's like every emergency room I've ever been to has speed bumps on the way to it. Isn't that weird? Like the place you need to get fastest? <laughs> How are memorials like that? Quick! It's okay. You okay, honey? Baby didn't come out? Okay, good. <laughs> Either you slow down or deliver the baby. <laughs> but there... I'm such a stupid person. <laughs> But there, there's a sense of like, well, let's go, let's go, let's go. And just, wait, wait, who touched me? And Peter almost seems a bit annoyed with him in a second. Because everyone probably was. What do, what do you mean? For, Jesus, for everyone else, this would be like, quick, come heal my child. And Jesus goes and heals the child. Let's go. And they're on their way, on their way. And Jesus is like, well, hey, they can take that house. <laughs> like, they don't know a miracle has occurred. They just think Jesus is. And the, the disciples treat it like it's odd. The disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, who touched me? Now this is, now this is, this is Peter, he would say. He would say, you see the crowd. Says, How can you say, you're touched me? You know, he's kind of mocking Jesus at this point. He doesn't know who Jesus is just yet. So he's a little abrupt. But Jesus is, Jesus is asking who, where did the power, where did, who did I just heal? I love that. Who did I just accidentally heal? Now, at this point, I think it's very important, and we may have to talk about this several times as we talk about the mirror's holes. It's very important to bring up that most, that, that, that day, that very day, in that very region, Another child, now Jesus does go, spoiler alert, Jesus goes on to heal that child. And that very day, another child probably died. Actually, in, while Jesus was walking around the earth, he healed, he didn't heal way more diseases than he actually healed. By, by quite a huge margin. So if, if your child was sick and you lived um, in Bethlehem and on this day he was in Capernaum, tough luck. 
It just, that's, that's how it happened. And so one of the mistakes we make whenever we, um, and for me, this alleviates one of the mistakes we make whenever we study the miracles, is we start looking at them as if the gospel writers wrote a book about the miracles. The gospel writers did not write a book about the miracles. They wrote a book about Jesus. And by telling us the stories of the miracles, they are they're telling us about Jesus. So if we go to these stories and we look at them and we say, well, how can I have a similar prayer or a similar um, disposition and get a miracle? Um, like how, how can I have a miracle work in my life? There are hundreds of books published every year about miracles and how you can say this special prayer, or you can do this certain thing, or you can follow this certain path, and all of a sudden, your prayers will start really getting answered because you figured out the cheat code, and the miracles are now going to start working. I don't deny anybody's story. Like, you come to me and you say, man, I'll tell you, we were in Guatemala, and there was this thing that happened, and we prayed over this girl, and she got up and started walking. I'm not going to then say, I don't know if that's true. I don't question anybody's story about stuff like that. But the purpose of the miracle story is not to tell us how we can do miracles. Actually, the first century church, or the, the, the last first and second century church after Jesus uh, died, they didn't look back and think, how can we, especially those who weren't like healing people and after Peter was getting people up and healing the blind and all that. After all of that, those people died. The people who were left didn't go around thinking, well, how can miracles happen in my life? You know what they did? They saw Jesus helping the sick, whether it was through miraculous works or not. And when plagues came and everyone fled the city except the sick, the Christians stayed there and died taking care of the ones who were dying. The miracles moved them to action, to act like Jesus, instead of acting like the sick and saying, well, Jesus, heal my pain too, or you're not legitimate. The miracle stories do not tell us about miracles. That's not their purpose. They tell us about Jesus. And if we, if we can find something in Jesus in these stories, we will, see, we will see how we can better follow Jesus. And if you picture this story in its, in its original context, in the actual dirt and dust of the, of the, of the narrative, we find, we find Jesus stopping and people confused. And then the woman, the woman comes up the woman comes up and says, he, he says he looked all around to see who had done it, but the, the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Now this is weird, guys. We will say, why? If I accidentally healed someone, I'm pretty sure they'd come up pretty happy. But she was unclean, and she shouldn't be just walking up touching people. And so she is a bit nervous. And also, it's just unfortunate in that context, she was a woman and just society considered her less than. She fell down and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now he didn't heal her just then. He says, Go in peace and continue to be healed of your disease. Your faith has made you well. Now, I am not, I am not proposing that if we could just get close, to, if we could just get closer to Jesus, then our diseases will be healed. I'm not proposing that if we could just get closer to Jesus, then our, then all that ails us will, will be gone. You get close to Jesus, sometimes life gets harder. What I am proposing is that Jesus valued this woman just as much as Jairus, which was a huge deal in their day. Jesus 
saw this synagogue leader, Jairus, and then saw this woman who was unclean and did not want to be touched, and saw them the same. And not just the same as each other, but the same as him. He valued Jairus and this woman equally. He truly loved them as he loved himself. As he loved himself. So what we have here in Mark is this... this um, Dual states. So we've got the, the rich, uh, respected, well, respected, clean man, and the disrespected, clean, unclean woman. And Jesus treats them both equally. Sometimes we get real dualistic about this. Like if, if we decide that we're going to treat the poor properly, we start hating the people who are rich. And if we want to be in that category, we say, well, you, you need to get a job. And so we, we usually pick people. But, but creating a hierarchy like that in which some people have a lot of value and some people have little value is a horrible way to live. Not just, it's not just detestable. It's not a good way for you to operate. It's not a good way for you to function. Here's an example. Uh, if you say you're in your car. Kids with, uh, parents with kids who are in the car with them. Now, I don't know how parents did this with before DVD players. Uh, I just don't know how that happened. Um, I don't know how my parents didn't just leave me and my siblings on the side of the road. And just drive off. And be like, y'all walk home. Actually, my, dad, my dad did that one time. He stopped and came back. There. But you're in the car and you're driving. And when you're on the road, you are, when you're driving, you're, you're in the, in what I call the, the, the most boring and deadliest video game ever. Just going 55 miles per hour down the road at the exact speed limit. And like Christians should. And you're focused. People are getting in your way. People are going probably slower than the speed limit. And you're, you're frustrated by the world. Now, the reason you're frustrated by the world is because on the road, everyone is less valuable than you. You see that? On the road, everyone is less valuable than me. Got in my way. Slowed me down. Now, when you're in that state of mind and your kids start fussing, just in the back, not even saying words, just your immediate response is to be a bad. 